So welcome to uh, celebrating Coltsfoot Valley and conservation in Cornwall. This is a view of the, of the valley. This is going to be a story of a family of the Conservation Trust and the town all cooperating to result in the conservation of Coltswood Valley at the same time allowing for some development. It's a, what I would call a both and proposition. And it's also a story of a family like many in Cornwall who have owned property in Cornwall for decades, if, and in this case, uh, maybe even over a century. But we can think of other families besides the Calhouns, the Hares, the Hearts, the Hares, uh, the Golds, and the Coolies, just to name a few, and the Hammonds, who have had property for many years in Cornwall, and there comes a time when the family has so many members and so many different needs that they need to uh, do something about that property. So this is a story of success uh, for both the family, the Co Conservation Trust, and uh, the town. So first, let me uh, just give you an overview of Cornwall and the land. This is uh, Cornwall, a map of Cornwall. I will point out that Cornwall is 46 square miles. Uh, you might be interested to know that Torrington is only 40 square miles. And if you remember the history uh, that we got the other day from uh, Torrington of, and Cornwall, in the early 1800s, there were actually more people in Cornwall than in Torrington although now we have only 1,500 people, they have 35,000. But it's interesting to note that they are six square miles smaller than Cornwall. The thing we're gonna focus on now is uh, Coltsfoot Valley. And this is the geology of Coltsfoot Valley and you'll see this marble. The green is a, a marble. And if you remember, marble is the result of uh, shells and other marine uh, life under pressure. And so uh, thinking of Hugh Cheney's uh, presentation about Cornwall and the geology of Cornwall, we were not only part of Africa, but that valley was underwater at some point. So that's uh, Cornwall writ large. And this is uh, a topographical map of the valley and some parts of Cornwall. This is the center of Cornwall. This is the valley here. These are the Coltsfoot Mountains here. And it's interesting to note how much prime farmland soils and statewide important farmland soils are scattered throughout the valley and frankly, the surrounding area, a large part uh, in thanks to that uh, uh, Lime uh, marble undercoating that that does a lot for the pH, as you know. Next, I'd like to uh, explore why it's called Colts, Coltsfoot Valley. I thought it was because of this flower, which is the Coltsfoot flower. Uh, it's a cousin of the dandelion. I read that the dandelion is from Eurasia and was introduced in North America in about the 1670s. Well, in fact, this flower was introduced only in the 1920s. So uh, I figured out that Coltsfoot Valley couldn't be named after this flower. And I was reading an 1881 uh, history of Litchfield County, which you can find online. And Coltsfoot Mountain was Colt apostrophe S Mountain. So I thought, well, Maybe they named this Coltsfoot Mountains after the Coltsfoot. And here you can see the Coltsfoot, it's kind of knobby and so on. Well, here's a view of the Coltsfoot Mountains from the east, uh, looking east rather from uh, this property that we just conserved here uh, from the Foot Poke Preserve. And it kind of sees knobby like Coltsfoot. Anyway, I'm going to give a prize for uh, anyone who comes up with the real reason why it's called Coltsfoot Valley. Well, you know that uh, 
Cornwall was auctioned off in 1738 to private property owners. And uh, in fact, Yale University continues to own 300 acres in Cornwall. And anyone who lives in Southeast Cornwall uh, in that 300 acres has a thousand year lease with uh, Yale. So the town was incorporated in 1740. And here's a, a new bus that has been purchased for Cornwall. Actually, no, this is a picture of a bus in Penzance in our namesake Cornwall, England. And you can see that they, even in Cornwall, England, they would like more people to come to Cornwall. So now the, the Calhouns arrived in Cornwall in, in the 1790s. Uh, Jedediah Calhoun was the original Calhoun in our, in our story. And this, they ran a boarding house and this is on Route 7 uh, as you go south, uh, but near Route 45. This is the house that was the boarding house here. And this is the cemetery. And the cemetery was renamed Calhoun Cemetery. You can see here it was called Puffingham Cemetery, but uh, it was renamed Calhoun Cemetery thanks to ancestors of Jedediah who became very successful as merchants and contributed to this. And that's really the story of how the Calhoun family started to acquire property in Coltsfoot Valley. So this is a picture of the next house, the next two houses really that the, the Calhoun family purchased. One is the Gracie house here. That was the first purchase. And then they purchased another house where the brick house is and that house burned. And this is the replacement of that house. And obviously the family did very well as the merchants in New York City. It's now owned by Laurie Simmons and Chip Dunham. And this was the dairy barn, which is now owned by John Old and John and Constance Old. So uh, even though this looks like a coffin, uh, I apologize for that. This is what 600 acres, which is ultimately what the, Col the Calhoun family came to own would look like, it's not quite 600 acres, but you can see the ski area over here. This is the center of town. And basically the Calhouns own ridge line to ridge line and the whole valley, almost 600 acres. Well, they were a very generous family. And the first thing they did was to donate the Cathedral Pines to the Nature Conservancy uh, which interestingly, that was in 1967. Interestingly, the Nature Conservancy donated it to the Conservation Trust in 2020 because it was too small a property. But you can see in 1906, this, uh, when it was owned by the Calhouns, uh, this would have been an iconic pine forest, uncut, the, I guess it's the largest stand of uncut forest pine forest in New England almost at the time. And of course we had our tornado in 1989 and this is what it looked like. And this is what uh, a view from the valley looking towards uh, Cathedral Pines and you can see there, there's still some significant uh, pine trees in there. The next thing that the uh, Calhoun family did was to sell about 200 acres of this mountainside to the state. And that is now Weontanoc State Forest. Uh, you may remember or know that the Appalachian Trail used to go along the ridgeline there. And now it's the Blue Trail, the Mohawk Trail. And the next thing that the Calhoun family did, uh, it, the water supply for Cornwall was up on Todd Hill Road. There was a spring up there and Bridgeport Hydraulics owned it. And it went by gravity to feed the town. Well, in the tornado, all that got destroyed. And so uh, 
Aquarion, the successor to Bridgeport Hydraulics, bought 18 acres in the northeast corner of uh, the Calhoun property. And these are the wells and the pump house that now serve the town. So now we're getting to what I call the moonshot. It was extremely complicated uh, transaction and it really required the cooperation of both the conservation trust, the family and the town in order to bring it about. But here's an idea. These are not all the Calhouns, but the ones that I could find that were members of this limited partnership. But any of you who come from large families and have land holdings that go back many, a generation or two, I'm the oldest of six, and we had some land on Martha's Vineyard. And I can tell you, trying to satisfy all the family needs and still uh, go ahead with the transaction is not easy. So anyway, the, this was in 1989. The Calhoun had hired a very good land use planning group to uh, come up with a plan to allow the valley to be both conserved and developed. And this is the transaction that we finally completed uh, at the time in 1989, there was a tax reason why conservation trust couldn't hold the easement and so the town did. But this is what happened. This is the valley and this is the conservation easement that the Calhouns put over what would be called the common land in the valley. And then they interspersed within the common land building lots. And this is a, a picture of that. This is the common land, the dark along the side. And then these are the building lots. And there were 20 building lots. And if you think about it, if this was 200 acres and we had five acre zoning, the family could have put possibly uh, 40 building lots in here. And it's a tribute to the family that uh, they allowed this to be conserved and developed and in a way that kept the beauty of the uh, valley. Very recently, another 24 acres have been conserved by near neighbors and uh, residents of Cornwall. This is 17 acres on the east side of the center of the Coltsworth Valley. And this is uh, the little knoll that was also conserved five acres on the west side of the valley. So not only did the <clears throat> a Calhoun family come up with a plan to both develop and conserve the property, but recently additional property has been conserved and linked up with that common property owned by the Cornwall Conservation Trust at this point. So here's a picture of, this is the old barn here, the house within the barn, actually Tim Prentice designed that I understand. But the thing I wanted to point out was this path. And this is really what I think has caused the valley to become what I call the central park of Cornwall. You can walk down this path and enjoy this beautiful valley uh, and it's really thanks to the generosity and of uh, both the Coltswood Valley Association and the Olds that this trail exists. Another interesting thing you can see here, this is Tommy Ucolito who is re redoing this barn for a cheese making uh, business. It's interesting to note again from that history of Cornwall that in the early 1800s, Cornwall produced 9,000 pounds of cheese. I don't think Tommy's gonna to do that, but you can see some of his cows. So we're gonna walk down into the valley here. And uh, another thing that John did was to put a bridge across Bird's Eye Brook so that uh, you could continue to walk on down the valley, actually to the little knoll. I wouldn't advise doing that right now because of tick season. 
But last winter when the ski uh, cross country skiing was really well done, uh, if, uh, available, we were able to ski across this bridge all the way down to the valley. The other thing I'd like to point out is Bird's Eye Brook, uh, which I thought was named at possibly after Bird's Eye Maple or maybe even after a bird. In fact, there was a family of, named Bird's Eye and that's what the brook's named after. So now the next shot is a picture of either Valley Brook or what's turns into Furnace Brook. And this is another aspect of the valley uh, for wildlife. Uh, it's called Furnace Brook, as you may know, because up until 1897, there was a blast furnace down in Cornwall Bridge that was used for iron making. Well, now this is a habitat. And one of the things that I found, uh, one of the little bits of wildlife walking along the side of the stream after a big flood just a few weeks ago was this crayfish. And you can see that I think he thought I was gonna grab him and eat him. But in fact, I threw him back in the pond, but uh, that's just one of the pieces of wildlife that live in this beautiful valley. And here's a, another resident of the valley that has caused some uh, flooding from time to time. Uh, this is the lodge. You can see in the background uh, uh, Sandy, Neubau Sandy and April Neubauer's house. Um, this is on the common land, and here's the, the habitat, the ha inhabitant. The, the beaver is a keystone species. Uh, they say keystone because the beaver alters the environment that uh, allows for habitat for others. And I'm told there are only two other keystone uh, species, humans and elephants. And I must say that humans probably aren't doing a great job of creating uh, habitat as much as destroying it. But at any rate, the beavers create habitat and you can see that there are turtles and frogs and others that, that live in that wonderful space. So this has been a real success story. This is another uh, bobolink that I took a picture of landing in the field. And you know uh, of the Coltsfoot Valley that uh, the bobolink requires a wide open space before they'll nest. And so uh, even the birds get a, a beautiful uh, setting in which to live. So that's the story of a success, a success on the part of uh, a family in Cornwall trying to figure out what to do with very valuable and historic family property and the Cornwall Conservation Trust uh, cooperating with them as well as the town. And you can see here, this is the Coltsfoot Valley conservation easement that is held by the Conservation Trust and is common property and allows for hiking and skiing and uh, public access. And the total at this point, this is 2019, we've added a, a few more acres, especially around uh, Weontanoc State Forest here. We added 100 acres here. Uh, Cornwall Conservation Trust now owns over 1,800 acres and has uh, under easement another 400 acres, so about 2,200 acres. But Hector Prudhomme would often point out, and I will too, that of the 1,800 acres, more than half of it was donated to Cornwall Conservation Trust by generous families in Cornwall. And so, uh, at any rate, that's the success story of Coltsfoot Valley, uh, a both and proposition. We had both development and conservation. And that's something that I hope we can continue in Cornwall. Here is uh, a, one last thought I'll give for you all. And before Will Calhoun, who I hope has signed on at this point. Uh, this is a map showing where various tribes inhabited this area, and you'll see the Wyoktanak tribe right here, 
was in this area and they lived for thousands of years in this environment and they allowed it to be sustainable. We are very recent arrivals, uh, maybe three or 400 years at the most of uh, inhabitants here. And I wonder a thousand years from now when whoever's living then will look back and say that we who inhabited this like the Native Americans and sustained it for thousands of years were able to sustain this for a, a thousand years. So now I'm going to stop sharing and see if Will Calhoun has come on. There's Will. Will uh Calhoun is president of the Coltsfoot Valley Association, which was created to allow the, the families that live in Coltsfoot Valley to make sure that the conservation easement and the building requirements were adhered to. It's really a, a, uh, a neighborhood association. And they are working closely with the Cornwall Conservation Trust going into the future to help us uh, with making sure that the terms of the conservation easement are adhered to. And so Will, as president of the Coltswood Valley Association, I'd like to give you a, a five or so minutes to talk about what it is you all do. There I am. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your meeting. Um, I've always wondered what went on because I see the track record that you all have and it's ins it's inspirational and it's a uh, sort of close to the core of my what my family has been doing for years my dad is a forester my brother and he both very active in land um, preservation and trusts and um, supporting um, that kind of thing up in southwestern New Hampshire, where they both spent their lives. Um, I, I grew up in New Hampshire and was there until I was 17 when my parents, uh, my, I lived in an old farmhouse with my parents and, a, and there were five of us siblings. Um, I had a wanderlust in the sense that I wanted to become a woodworker. I wasn't going to be a forester like my Swiss grandfather or lumberman like my um, grandfather, uh, Jack Calhoun, who retired to Cornwall, grew up in Cornwall, um, but I wanted to work with wood. So I went off and did that and uh, grew an affinity for all of that sort of thing from Southern Maine to Southern, uh, Southeastern Massachusetts. And then I didn't see much of Cornwall during my young years, I, uh, but it, it took an introduction sort of uh, through family members. My, my, uh, my dad's um, mother died, Salome Cecilia Machado died, and um, my grandfather remarried, so I met um, his second wife. She was my grandmother. And, but I came to Cornwall because I made a real connection with, with Prentice, with Tim Prentice specifically. I got to be his first apprentice making sculptures the first um, three years or for three years of my college experience. And um, so I had the pleasure of being in Cornwall. And, um, but I would have to say that the people who brought me back to Cornwall were not the Calhouns, but the Machados. So, um, so there I was living in Cornwall about drawn to the Coltswood Valley because it was this sort of abandoned farmstead. It was this sort of um, ill-defined, overgrown, derelict might be a word that could be used, farm that had sort of had its heyday and was on its way out. And I've just lost power here. So I don't know if I'm just disappeared. We can still hear you. You can still hear me. There I am in color and not. 
anyway, the long story short is that I spent quite a bit of time crawling around Cole's foot and um, learning more about it, and reached a point in my life when I wanted to build something. My father and his brother had been gifted land known. I'm back. Yeah. And, uh, I do apologize. We do lose power down here periodically. Yep. Sorry to share that with you. So I guess what I want to just wrap up here saying is that I'm proud of, to be um, a member of a family that was able to come yeah. to and create what is now the Coltswood Valley in a partnership with the Cornwall Conservation Trust that has recovered from a place that I think was derelict to, and now it is a property that is available for people to enjoy, to be able to um, walk on, to uh, gaze at. And um, I think that we've, I think we're all fortunate that we've managed to hang on to the more aesthetic and beautiful aspects of this valley. So um, we're grateful to the Conservation Trust. We're very happy to be finally sort of linked arms. We have much to learn from your expertise. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I'm very sorry that my presentation went off on three wheels, but um, I look forward to uh, uh, working with you in the future. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Will, and, and thanks to the Calhoun family and the Coltswood Valley Association. Uh, we temporarily lost power here on Popple Swamp, so uh, I missed part of your presentation. I don't know whether everybody else has uh, lost power, but uh, it happens here in Cornwall from time to time. Very unusual. Uh, okay, so that's really uh, the end of our our planned meeting. Uh, Kara, I don't know whether anyone has sent any questions in to you. I have um, not seen any questions. All right. Well, that's probably uh, good. Um, if anyone would like to send a question in uh, to, to Kara, uh, please do so. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about uh, the Conservation Trust and what we're up to. Uh, maybe while we're waiting for a question or two, uh, our annual report is out. And one of the items in the annual report was a cooperative agreement we're entering into with the Northeast Wilderness Trust. Uh, we own about 350 acres on Johnson Road. Uh, we purchased about 60 and we were donated about 190, almost 200 acres, well, 300 acres pra practically. Uh, by two generous families, uh, the Knotts, Dobbs, and the uh, Green family. And we're going to enter into a forever wild easement over those properties that will continue to allow us to have access for hiking and recreation, but we will not be cutting trees or doing anything else to the forest, it's uh, Northeast Wilderness Trust is rewilding parts of, a, of uh, the Northeast. And we'll be one of the first uh, rewilding projects here in Connecticut. And I think it will do a lot for habitat. As you know, uh, we are facing the sixth extinction and uh, habitat for wildlife is being subdivided and split up and destroyed. And this will help to do that. Uh, and so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, we expect to sign that agreement in the spring uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and that's a very important aspect of what we're, we're about. That is preserving habitat for wildlife. Uh, Anything else at this point, Kara? Uh, yes, we do have a question. Uh, how many of the 20 developable, lot, developable lots have been built on? Uh, Will, you might have to help me out on that. I, 
Yeah, I just saw that question, Shelley, and um, we're very, it's another piece of good fortune for all of us. There are a number of property owners within the Valley who have purchased two, purchased another or maybe two other parcels. There are pieces of land in the Valley that could be developed that have not been developed. Um, one, uh, two of which are the uh, John and Constance Olds parcels where the cattle are um, close up to the road and then down by Birdseye Brook. So that makes a big difference. Up on the ridge of Colts uh, by White Rock, which is closer to Great Hollow Road, there were some good sized lots up there. And those are were purchased uh, largely by the Laporta brothers, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I do think that Jim and Sarah would like to build up there at some point, but um, that means they're gonna put in a long driveway. And um, I think the bottom line is that short of one parcel in the core of the valley that's right across from the Jacobson barn, it is the other piece of par property that um, was not purchased by the uh, Conservation Trust, the, the, the property that has got a, a piece of field attached to it and forest up to the east. That is um, um, currently being considered for a house. And um, we are um, uh, looking closely at the design and uh, in dialogue with the, uh, the owners. And um, we'll see how this all plays out. We we would like if something is going to be built there, we would like it to be part of the landscape and not um, sort of overlooking the landscape so that all of us have to see their house first. So um, stay tuned. So there so, are about what eight eight houses uh, in the valley that are on those lots at this point. I think that there's only one lot that really will be built on that we know about in the foreseeable future. Okay. Oh, what's going to happen to the old property properties if that's ever going to change? Yeah. Um, but I think everything else is really in very good shape in terms of uh, being able to be, develop it. I think we're almost looking at what it's going to look like right now. Oh, good. That's very good. Perpetuity. Yeah. Um, so, Kara, can you read me Peter Del Tredici's uh, question? Yes. Uh, there is a new movement within conservation trusts around New England to combine conservation lands with affordable housing plots. Has CCT considered this? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we certainly support uh, affordable housing. Uh, it's interesting you note that Vermont has a commission that is uh, called both conservation and affordable housing. Uh, that's a statewide commission. It's a, it's a challenge. Anytime we develop a piece of property, purchase a piece of property for conservation, we've asked the uh, seller whether we could hive off a piece for affordable housing. So far, uh, the one piece of property on Johnson Road that was owned by a group of hunters uh, they said, no, they didn't want that to happen. Uh, there was another piece of property uh, over near the school that was for sale by the Gilsher family. And we tried to get them to sell that for conservation and let us uh, hive off two acres for affordable housing. Uh, but ultimately we weren't able to persuade them to do that. It's now been sold to uh, uh, directly to someone. So it's, it's a real issue. Uh, and I, I often hear that one of the things that buying conserved land does is take it off the market or cause the rest of the land to be more uh, costly. But I will say that, uh, first of all, Cornwall has a lot of land and land is not the constraint for affordable housing. The constraint for affordable housing really is the cost of building a house and septic and driveway and uh, all of that. Um, but we want to work cooperatively and do what we can to find space 
uh, for affordable housing, but our mission is conservation. Uh, we'll work with the housing corp corporation cooperatively, but it's not in our mission to uh, pay for or su financially support affordable housing. But we definitely see the need to do both. And I would like Cornwall to understand that the Conservation Trust is a organization that wants to support both keeping Cornwall green and having a vital uh, economic base in Cornwall, and that will include affordable housing. But we hope we can come up with creative ways to do that, somewhat like the Calhoun family, and keep the look and feel of a green Cornwall at the same time we uh, address needs like affordable housing. I think, for example, the wastewater treatment facility that hopefully will go into uh, 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 operation in West Cornwall would allow for that area to be built more densely. And with that, to allow for maybe some apartments, you know, our our town is aging, and uh, personally, uh, Debbie and I have a lovely large house on Popple Swamp Road, but we are often talking about down, downsizing, and boy, if there was a nice apartment house, 80% affordable and 20% or, or you know, 80-20 in West Cornwall, as a fly fisherman, I'd love to have the penthouse looking out over the, over the river. So anyway, bottom line, sorry to say that we do support affordable housing, uh, but we can't, uh, as a, a not-for-profit focused on conservation, actually devote money to it. But we can certainly devote time and energy and planning and working with others to see that happen. So that's a good question and uh, one that definitely needs to be addressed. Anything else, Kara? Uh, no, nope, that seems to be it, Bart. All right, well, um, it is 4.47. Uh, thank you all for coming to this meeting. Again, uh, celebrating Coltsfoot Valley, the conservation by, I love that dog, Jean. Coltsfoot Valley and uh, the success of the Calhoun family, the Conservation Trust and the town working together to keep Cornwall green and at the same time allow it to be developed. So thank you again for all your support and we'll look forward to seeing you out at the Central Park of Cornwall on a walk someday in uh, Coltsfoot Valley. So we'll sign off and uh, see you in the Valley. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Bye.